Welcome to PSNN's monthly webinar series. Today's webinar will cover what trade show organizers want, the forces that drive technology purchases, all lines have been placed on listen-only mode, and the floor will be open for your questions and comments following the presentation. If you would like to submit a question or comment at any time during the webinar, you may use the chat box located on the lower right-hand side of your screen. Simply type your message into the box and click on the Send button. If you should require assistance throughout the conference, please press star zero to reach a live operator. Questions will be addressed in the last 10 to 15 minutes of the webinar, but you can mit submit a question at any time. Alternatively, you can join the conversation and ask questions on Twitter at hashtag TSNNWebinar. At this time, it is my pleasure to turn the floor to Arlene Schultz, Marketing Manager for TSNN. The floor is yours. Greetings, everyone. Thanks for joining us today to TSNN's complimentary webinar series where we continue to offer valuable content on a monthly basis to our subscribers. We would like to thank our sponsors today, MCCA, Advantage Boston, Market Art, and OnStream Media. They continue to help us deliver these educational topics to you. If you've attended any of TSN's recent webinars, you may have noticed they were brought to you by OnStream Media, the leader in multimedia webinar and webcasting services. Did you know that the same technology can help you get better results for your own organization? OnStream's virtual event solutions can connect you with colleagues and customers, extend the value of your events, and boost profits. Webinars and webcasts provide a platform for branded virtual events that can enhance the value of a live show or operate as single revenue generating events. For a free demo and to learn more about how OnStream webinars and webcasts bring measurable ROI, visit onstreammedia.com. And now I'd like to introduce everyone to Mr. Rob Hamlin, President and CEO at MarkedArt. Rob? Thank you, Arlene, and thanks everyone for being on today. We're really pleased to be a sponsor of this webinar as well. Uh, it's a great topic, very timely. Uh, yeah, again, I'm, I'm Rob Hamlin from MarkedArt. We make the uh, UR here interactive map and directory system. And as technology providers in this market, we're just very focused on how to continue to bring new technologies to bear in ways that really help event managers, uh, help enhance attendee experience, drive value for exhibitors, produce better events. And uh, webinars like this, it's, it's great to hear from the people who are making those decisions themselves. Um, we've got some wonderful panelists today, and I have the honor of introducing our host, Michelle Bruno, who uh, will then herself introduce the panelists to you and, and work with you. Uh, I'm sure many of you already know Michelle Bruno. She's the president of Bruno Signature Events, which is a content strategy firm based in Salt Lake City. I stole a line from her bio for this. Uh, Ma, uh, Michelle, uh, Michelle modestly describes herself as someone who comes from the event industry and understands the trade show and conference ecosystem with a mission to chronicle the changes, innovation, technology, and digital ed evolution that's impacting the industry so profoundly. And you've probably had a chance to see some of her work along those lines in her writing and her blogging, especially for TSNN. She's published literally hundreds of articles and several white papers on, on meeting and exhibition logistics, marketing, technology for event industry publications. And she's also done a lot for the Center for Exhibition Industry Research. She's a blogger. She blogs about social media, technology, and innovation. Uh, and, uh, she, and, and especially in the events industry publications at ForkInTheRoadBlog.com. Again, that's ForkInTheRoadBlog.com. So, with that, let me introduce your host, Michelle Bruno. Michelle. Thank you so much, Rob. As always, what a gracious introduction. I'm hoping that everybody that's on the webinar today will go over to Market Arts website and check out some of the great products they have. But today, we're going to talking about we're going to be talking about just those types of things. Um, it's always intrigued me. Uh, the subject that, that about of what trade show organizers, organizers want, um, the things that uh, enter into their decision making about purchasing technology, what they're looking for, what they like and don't like about vendors. And today I'm hoping we're going to have a really casual but informative discussion with three representatives from different corners of the live industry. I'm clicking, waiting for the next slide. And today we have our, our panelists. Andrea Barr is Special Projects Manager with the Society of Petroleum Engineers. They produce the mega show 
the Offshore Technology Conference, as well as many events around the world. We've got Scott Lum, Digital Marketing Manager Events from Microsoft Corporation. Everybody knows who Microsoft is. And April Wilson, Director of Trade Show Marketing with Hanley Wood Exhibitions. They're also a large trade show organizer in the for-profit space, producing World of Concrete services and a number of other large trade shows. And I've got a bunch of um, questions sort of lined up. Um, first, I want each of the panelists to sort of talk a little bit about themselves, kind of introduce themselves in terms of how it is that they come to making decisions about technology, reviewing technology from their particular um, vantage point in events in their organizations. And for some reason, Melinda, this slide will not advance. There we go. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask um, Andrea to start first. Talk a little bit, Andrea, about about your your position there at SPE. How is it that you come to review technology for events and um, things like that? What's what's the context of your um, position there? Thank you, Michelle. Um, I get I have the opportunity to research technologies that offer new visibility for our sponsors, as well as improve the attendee and exper exhibitor experience for all of our events. It's um, basically, I, I look at the, all of our events from our largest one, being the Offshore Technology Conference, to some of our smaller ones and the individual needs of each of those audiences and try to find what will improve the experience for both attendees and exhibitors. Great, Scott. So. I'm asking you to be sort of the poster boy for uh, poster child for the corporate event space. And in, in your position at Microsoft, how is it that you come to be able to review and evaluate and purchase technology? So I, I'm actually a content marketing manager at Microsoft, but my primary focus has been on um, digital events and hybrid events. So how can we take a lot of the um, – efforts that we do from a face-to-face -face experience and um, put it into a digital environment to help scale out the reach. And the team that I've been um, working on has uh, um, put together the Tech Ed Conference for our IT pros and developers, and it's about a 7,000 know, attendee event. And um, I work with uh, um, event managers on thinking through what is the, the so social strategy uh, what is it, how do we uh, integrate mobile, and how do we um, you know integrate a lot of our digital efforts into the the event itself? So so we look at how do we take the, the convergence of the face to face with all of these other newer channels that that are starting to hit. Great. And April, you you enter yet from a third direction, that of the for profit trade show organizer, but in your capacity in marketing, primarily. How is it that you come to event technology decision making? That's actually a very interesting question in that my role here at Hanley Wood Exhibitions is to oversee all the marketing touch points. So we've got the analog, right, so all the print pieces, on-show signage, special events, on-show. And then we have all of the digital components as well, so the social media promotions, email marketing, PPC marketing, usability on our website. So. I kind of wear a lot of different hats depending on what we're working on, what show happens to be in season, what our strategy is. And my approach to technology is I'm basically looking for one of two things. A, it helps my marketers do their job better, or B, it meets a customer need. And that's basically my approach to any event technology. Fantastic. So, so what we have here is really three different approaches, three different uh, direction, even each of the panelists comes to it from a different position within their organization. So I'm really excited about the discussion kind of going forward. Um, so the first question is, how do you all find out about event-related technology? What are you reading? Who are you following? Do you actually still read print magazines? Are you looking at blogs? Are you getting your information from Twitter? Are you going to trade shows? How are you finding out about the full range of options that are out there? And I'm going to put this to you first, Scott, to answer that question. 
So I look at it, um, you know, primarily two ways that I, I think to, about technology. Um, the first way is find out what the problem is and then hunt for the solution. So once I define that I have a challenge that I need to fill, whether it's how to better engage your audience or how to, um, you know, make the, the show floor more compelling, um, then, then once I define what the problem is, then I hunt for a technology solution to, to make that happen. The second way is to find a technology and then reimagine how I can use it. So if I am out somewhere and I, and I read about a technology um, on a website or through social media, then it's like, how can I use that technology in a way that, that will enhance the experience at the, the event itself or try, and use it to solve some of the problems that I'm trying to solve? So, you know, a lot of things I'll do is, you know, go to other shows, uh, see what, what's going on because... You know, in other industries, some shows are more vibrant than others as far as the the technologies that they use on the, the show floor. So it's always good to see um, what other um, trade what other people are doing at other trade shows. Um, I, I also like to um, do Twitter chats and engage with other event managers, get their ideas on what's going on, and then you know um, you know comb through social media. Um, I also like to read about, you know, retail solutions because I find a lot of things that are coming down through retail um, are very appropriate for trade shows. So uh, as as the um, as commerce starts to start, um, the point of sale starts to develop, you know, I try to think how can I take some of the those solutions that they're creating for retail and put it into the trade show environment. So what do you mean by retail? You mean um, consumer-oriented um, channels or still in B2B channels, um, but at the retail level? Uh, I, I, I look at both. So, um, you know, a, a lot of times what they will do for the B2C environment, so in the retail floor, um, I take a look at that technology that they're using uh, at the point of sale. So are they using touch screens? Are they using... Um, near field communications. How are they using mobile? So, you, you know, the, the, those those B two C environments are trying to create some really compelling ways to get people to convert to a sale. And to me, that 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 is interesting. To how do you get people's attention on the trade show floor? Mm -hmm. So, April, um, same question to you. What are you reading? Who are you following? How do you, you know, keep your Keep the pulse on this huge, huge subject, technology and events. For me, it's all about one big thing, and that's listening. So whether that is actually walking the show floor and listening to what attendees or exhibitors are saying, like, I wish we had some way to do X, Y, Z, or I was at another show and they did A, B, C, so why don't they do it here? So actually really physically listening when I'm actually on the show floor and in the show environment. I do a lot of online listening, so I have several different Google Alerts set up on topics around technology and trade shows, specifically around problems that we're trying to solve for our attendees or our exhibitors. I love, absolutely love the LinkedIn groups around this topic. Like I'm part of the CISO group, and I love the CISO group on LinkedIn. I learn a whole lot from Stephanie pretty much on a weekly basis in terms of what some of the other trade shows are doing in the space, new technology, or even new privacy constraints that might have been legislated that might impact some of the technology we've already implemented, those sorts of things. And then, of course, I follow you, which is how we know each other. <laughs> well, thanks for that. Um, Andrea, I've seen you at so many events over the years kind of scoping out what's new and, and what's coming. But um, do you have any favorite sources that you use to find out about event-specific technology? Well, I, um, of course, I listen to you. Um, and I go to a lot of events. Um, I do a hybrid of what Scott and April have both said so far. Um, I look. I do a lot of listening. I actually, when I'm on the show floor with my attendees and my exhibitors, is I listen to them. I actually go up and talk to some of my exhibitors and say, what can we do to make your show experience better? What have you seen at other shows? 
and I've had this relationship with my exhibitors for several years now, so they actually will come to me and say, hey, wouldn't it be cool if blah, 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 or we were exhibited at X show and we did blah, blah, blah. And so I'll start talking to those vendors. Um, however, I, the IAEE annual meeting is huge for me because there's lots of toys for me to get to play with. They do a lot of introductions there. And I just like to keep my ear to the ground and listen to what's going on and see what other people are doing. And just even if it's not helpful for my event today, seeing how other people are implementing technology and how it helps them and their events helps me to know what's going on and see whether or not we can use it in the future. Great. Next question is, I'm, I'm really curious about within your organization, and they're all, you know, different, I would imagine, in terms of, you know, what you can and can't do and, and what factors they you're allowed to even consider, but I'm wondering about what drives your purchasing decisions. Do you have specific constraints? Um, about technology? Are you restricted to vendors? Um, I would think this would be maybe an issue at Microsoft. Um, you have to look for um, just anything that stays within a budget. Uh, you know, what, what, when you go into these purchasing decisions, what is it that, that holds you back or informs the types of technology you can purchase? And I, I'm going to start with April on that first. Sure. So first, there's the obvious consideration of can we afford it, right? Because that's, I'm a marketer, budget and ROI are my life. So if I can't prove that it's a worthwhile investment, it, it kind of flies right off the door. So first of all, it's got to be in budget. But most importantly, does the solution actually meet our needs? So when I talk about factors that drive the purchase decision, what we really focus on are what are all of our requirements for the problem that we're trying to solve? And then does the solution that we're talking to or the vendor partner or the partner that we're talking to, do they actually meet the majority of those if we kind of run down them in a checklist format? And then the other thing I do, because I, like, you're going to hear a theme, it's all about listening. I will actually get on my Twitter. I will get on LinkedIn. I will ask the folks that are in my network if they have ever used any of the vendors that I'm considering working with to get primary feedback from actual customers. That's also a pretty big factor because you can learn a whole lot sort of behind the scenes that way. So that's my answer. Yeah, Andrea, um, within an association environment, you know, what are your, your constraints or what, what factors drive your purchasing decisions in your association? I'm going to also parrot what um, April just said because that's huge as to what I do as well. And for associations and nonprofits, budget is is paramount. If we don't, finding the, the budget is huge. Nonetheless, if we can get a sponsor to sponsor it, that's also very helpful. So if there's a need from the exhibitor community, then there's the working within, okay, an exhibitor wants X, what's the best to fulfill X, and then how to get the best visibility for that sponsor and the best value for the for the cost. So for us, budget is huge. And then, again, will people use it? We look at the statistics on the back end, uh, how many users, how many uh, for apps, how many downloads, how many, uh, how many clicks here, there, and wherever. And for us, the visibility is huge. And I also, once something comes out, I, again, talk to my exhibitors on the show floor, talk to some of the attendees on the show floor, and then, of course, behind the scenes, see what the tw what's being said on Twitter. Well, before I get to Scott to answer that question, I want to throw this back at you, Andrea, and April. This whole idea of budget. I mean, I understand it, you know, in my gut. But at a certain point, um, don't you, as, as reviewers of technology, sort of start um, looking at value versus budget? I mean, um, you know, at, at a certain point in decision making, you, you, as representative of your organization, there, there's a tipping point which says that even though this is probably a little bit outside my budget, I feel that something is so valuable going forward that I'm going to really champion that in my organization. So budget then becomes almost less of a consideration because the value is so high. April, what do you what do you think about that? I really think that it depends on what kind of technology we're talking about. So if it's replacing an existing system or partner, I think that budget conversation pretty much has already been had. 
But if it's something that we don't have that is pretty much the cost of entry in the trade show these days, like having a mobile app for participants to use on site, we might not have had that. But now if you're a trade show, you really need to have that. It's part of the attendee experience, just like giving them all of the printed materials when they get their badge. So for those kinds of things that drive value and our cost of entry, we will look to find the budget if it was not already scoped. And then when you think like the sexy factor, so what kinds of cool things can we have on site like fancy real-time interactive Twitter boards that might be you know, on these giant monitors, those are really experiential and you have to go, okay, well how am I going to know on the back end whether or not it worked? What metrics, like Andrea had mentioned, can I use or can we proxy to see if this is effective and something that we'll want to invest in going forward? So, so then, Andrea, in terms of budget, is it like a fixed budget that you would have, and in order to accept something new, which you consider high-value technology, you have to kick something else out? You know, are we are we strictly, you know, adhering to budgets nowadays, or are we going to start looking at other things that have high value and maybe bend the rules a little? Uh, I'm huge on budget. Um, I don't have a lot of flexibility. For me to introduce something new requires a lot of championing and a lot of proving the value to our exhibitors and our attendees. Occasionally, if there is – frequently, actually, if there's an exhibitor who came to me and said, we used X at the show, we'd really love for you to bring it to our show, I will have multiple conversations with them, get my sales department involved, and really work on getting a sponsorship, partial or whatever, to make that happen. For us, however, budget is king. I, even as sexy as it may be, if I can't come up with some way to sponsor it, I typically get to keep championing until I do. Mm -hmm. So, Scott, where do you weigh in on, on factors that drive your purchasing decisions? I mean, hey, you're with Microsoft. You have all the money in the world and all of the, the leverage in the world, right? Yeah, I wish. Um, it, it's... Um we, number one, we do have a very rigorous uh, procure, procurement process, so um, we just can't go out and, and choose the vendors that, that we wish. I mean, there, there's a way to, if we find a solution um, that we like, we can get it through the, um, the vendor process, but it's pretty rigorous. Um, but when it comes to budget, um, a, lot of, a lot of the things that, we, that I look at is how can I get the most value from it? And, and like, like you're mentioning, is you know, it, what is the cost of the, the solution versus you know, what is the value I'm going to get from um, having that solution in place? Um, and I, I, what I, what my particular focus is is on how how can we take the existing technologies and do it less expensively. Um, so so a lot of times I'll try and I'll pilot um things you know on a shoestring. So I try to reimagine things with um the the technologies that are out there and um tr try to get you know get more out of the technology than what it, what what I'm um uh, paying for. So you know some of the things that I'm looking at is how well does the technology fit the problem that I'm trying to solve for. So uh, I've seen a lot of people use technology on the show floor just for technology's sake, you know, like a, a flat screen monitor where, or, or a touch screen monitor where you, if a, you could have used a PC with a keyboard much more effectively, then it doesn't make sense for you to use that technology. But if I can bring that touch screen monitor to life, and get people to touch things and, and play with things and, and really interact with it, then it's worth my time looking into it. Um, you know, how well does it integrate with our existing solutions? I, I don't want to get technologies that are going to stand alone in a silo. Um, so how can I get, if, if it, um, I get people to interact with it, how can I hook it to our CRM system or how can I get it into a lead management system? So I want to make sure that whatever we're doing, it makes sense in the bigger, you know, in the big, bigger scheme of things. Um, we also have to take a look at, you know, um, is it a complementary platform for us? Is it a competitive platform? Uh, we want to make sure that we're, we're supporting, you know, our, our partner ecosystem. 
Um, and then um, we have a lot of events throughout the year. Um, and so what, what I'm looking at is can, can we use that technology long term? So can we use it for, um, uh, you know, uh, and reuse it in other ways? Or is it just a short-term solution? So, so those are just kind of kind of some of the things that we think through when, when we when we look for a, a solution. So I'm going to stay with you, Scott, because you you just talked about you know in your sort of procurement department, um, you mentioned that you have you know certain vendors that you can and can't work with and things like that. So could you explain? And I'm wondering if it's um, as far as you know similar in other corporate events types of environments. What is the inter what are the internal procedures for, for making a technology purchase? Do you use RFPs? Do you yes. allow companies to submit a formal RFP and how do they navigate your system? Yeah, so so if if we um um if we have a solution and we don't have a partner that, that's already um been approved through our vendor system, um we, what we'll do is we'll have an we'll we'll bid it out and put it on our uh, an RFP process and then we'll, once that vendor is selected as part of the RFP then we'll uh you know work on getting them you know approved as as one of our vendors. And and then Andrea, you know, in, in your association, do you use RFPs to make purchases? Um how do vendors know what you're looking for and that they can actually even bid on you know providing some technology or platform? We use quite a bit of a hybrid approach for uh, software or new internal systems or for really large projects. We will use an RFP process. To introduce new items, I typically have to really prove the need for new technology onto our conferences or show floors. So I do a large, broad-scale kind of a research project as to what is the need who fits that need, the pros and the cons of that, and I submit a report and present to upper management. And so therefore, when we originally introduce a new technology, it is not typically gone through an RFP process. However, once that technology takes place and is repeated several times, we will likely go back and do an RFP process to confirm that we're still getting the best value mm -hmm. and customer service. In April, in a, in a for-profit exhibition environment, um, how do you go about internally selecting and purchasing technology that you find? Well, I feel like I'm accidentally plugging adult diapers because I keep saying depends. It depends on what it is. <laughs> so we, if, if it's a major initiative, like, for example, we're looking for a marketing automation solution or we're looking our contract with our existing email service provider is up, who else is in the space, what should we be looking for, then yes, it will go through a formal RFP process. But if it's a smaller pilot program, so for example, we want to try the effectiveness of promoted tweets or we want to try um, some other sort of digital marketing tactic that we haven't previously tried or what's the best partner solution to have a Twitter board on site? If it's just a small little pilot program that we're doing maybe at one of the shows based on what we think is going to resonate with their audience, no, we, we'll just actually go in and try it. And of course, we always love free demos of things because we love to kick the tires and look under the hood before we commit. So that's how we approach it. Hey, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just stay with you, April. You've all three sort of expressed this idea that you have this this um, need first, and then you pursue technology that meets your needs. But if we put that aside, is there any particular technology that you're looking at that that um, you can repurpose, that is fascinating, that um, is something that you think you could wrap your arms around going forward, either virtual, social, mobile, tablet, um, database stuff? I know you do a lot with databases, April, CRM. What is it that you're looking at, and what's on your radar now? We have a couple of different things that are on our radar. Mostly we're looking at technology that basically helps us plug one system into another so that we can kind of get a comprehensive portrait of our audience and how do they ebb and flow between relationships with us. So you have some folks that will take a show, 
year off. You have other folks that will come as an attendee one year and then exhibit the next year and then take a year off. So what what do those relationships look like? What kind of patterns can we discern there? What kind of customer insight can we gather? So a lot of the technology that I'm focused on right now is what allows me to plug in all of these different systems that we as trade show producers have to live with so that I can kind of see it all in one happy little place. That's part one. Part two is are we really making the most of what we've already invested in? So that's sort of my other. So I'm working with the folks that we already have contracts with to say, are we using what you gave us correctly? Is there something cooler that we should be doing with this? Do you have case studies of other folks that are like us that we can learn from? Um, so, yeah, I just got off the plane with uh, uh, from a Pardot conference. We just signed those them as our marketing automation solution a couple of months ago, and I came away very inspired having talked to a lot of clients, sitting in on several different sessions. That's sort of what I'm obsessed with this week. But by next week, it will be something new. I guarantee it. I mean, are you finding your vendors right now being proactive in coming back at you and saying, you know, we are already have we already have a relationship, but here's how we might be able to, you know, bump it up a notch or integrate more fully with what you've got? Or, or are they waiting for you to come to them and say, I need this? Um, I hate being upsold. So if it's something like you should have this extra license to solve a problem that I've never talked to you about, that bothers me. If it's more of uh, me coming to them or them saying, hey, just so you know, we notice you're not using feature X on your particular tool. Is there a strategic reason for that? Here's, here's what it's for. Can I walk you through it and help you? That means a whole lot more to me. I, I have been sold to and then I have been partnered with, and it makes a big difference between the two. Scott, I mean, being with a technology company, um, I'm interested in do you feel like you're under pressure to always, you know, look at and, and search out the most cutting-edge thing and just be ahead of the game? And how does that inform, you know, what you're looking at now in terms of technology that's going to fulfill all of your, your many missions in life and your job? Yeah, so the the key is not to um feel that you have to stay out on the bleeding edge of things. Um so but but we do want to to find ways that we can showcase our technologies better and 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 kind of wow uh users so so what you know my focus is how do we enhance the attendee experience? You know, um and get and do it in a way that it resonates with the audience. So I don't want to wow them just for the sake of wowing them. I want I want to um, showcase technology in a way that uh, it makes sense and it, it resonates well with our technical audience, um, and 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 kind of empower them to see, oh, I can use technology in this way as well. So um, my focus is you know, on, on enhancing the attendee engagement, how do I grab their attention in, in um, interesting ways. Um, I look at um, the convergence between um, in-person events with uh, digital, with mobile, with traditional marketing. So, so I look at it kind of a, as a more holistic content marketing strategy. Um, so extending the life of the in-person event beyond the in-person event. So how can how can we really um, extend experience through a lot of these digital experiences? Um, I look at um, we look at things like touchscreen interfaces. I, I love the ability um, not uh, I love the ability for touchscreens to kind of tell a story. Um, so it puts the onus on creating really compelling ways to tell that story. Um, the the touchscreen is just is just a tool. But the story is, is going to be the bigger part of that. Um, we, um, I'm also, you know, taking a lot of time on looking at responsive web design. Um, not now that a lot of people are having a lot of different screens. You know, you have the tablet, the mobile, you have the cell phone, uh, the PC screens. Uh, rather than creating um, apps versus uh, a website that only works with one or two screens, I want to be able to use you know, look at re using responsive web design to um, integrate with all the different screens. Um, I'm, I'm also focused on doing low-cost hybrid events. 
Uh, we, we throughout every any one week at you know at Microsoft, we have these in-person events going on. So how can I very in a very low-cost way um, stream a lot of those hybrid events? Um, you know, how do I take a lot of our uh, in-person event and then make it a 365 engagement? So rather than making the you know tech ed being a point in time, how do I make it a, a year-round engagement? Andrea, from the association perspective, what are you looking at now? As we go more global, we're looking at cutting down on printing costs. So we're really looking at mobile solutions and um, how to get more into that digital realm as, so that whenever we are on site, our programs are smaller, it gets the information in people's hands, and whenever we send out mailers, we're no longer sending these big brochures and flyers. We're sending smaller postcards and getting people to go either to an app or to an online experience to get correct and current updated information. Um, the Brazil, Latin America, and Caribbean, they're very, very, very focused on recycling and the green effort. So we're trying to meet that need. So we're really focused on improving that mobile experience. And then secondarily, to add to what Scott was saying, is video and online streaming and how to extend our event beyond the event, keep it going and keeping it live for 365 days a year, um, especially with offshore platforms. We have people that are working, working on two weeks and off two weeks, and so being able to deliver the conference to those who actually can't get there, that's, that's huge right, for us right now. I'm going to stay with you, Andrea, too, for the next question, which is, you know, what kinds of reservations do you typically have? Are we talking, when you're dealing with a, a vendor or platform or a specific technology, are we talking about concerns with integration with your legacy platforms? Are we concerned with how vendors can support your purchases? Because a lot of these things are, you know, with startups or new sort of bleeding-edge platforms. Are you most concerned about how the technology fits in your overall strategy? But once you find a technology and you've kind of got your sights set on a vendor, what's kind of, you know, what are the butterflies in your stomach saying? Um, integration is a part, being able to export what we've learned and bring that into our disparate systems is very important to us. Unfortunately, we're still, that's more of a challenge for us. Um, what gives me butterflies or what I look for, um, I want someone to partner with. I don't want someone who's going to tell me what, what they have and then I have to conform to what they have. I want someone that will help me improve my processes and will take my input and improve their systems for me as well and so that we can go hand in hand and improve everything in the relationship moving forward. Customer service is huge. It always terrifies me that when they say, but once you make that sell, they're always there for you whenever they want to make that sell. Are they still going to be there for me once we're doing the implementation? So the, those things really scare me. Scott, what do you, what do you think? What, what, do you, what kind of worries you from the outset about going with somebody or something new? Um. Yes, yeah, see, see um, very similar. You know, the big some of the biggest cost is not on the cost of what what the technology itself costs, but it, the cost for integrating it. And um, so we need to make sure that when we get the technology itself, that the uh, we understand what's it going to be involved with integrating that and and customizing the solution specifically for us. Um, so, so we want to understand what it, what is the overall cost going to come out, not just the cost of you know, you know the the solution out of the box. Um, and a lot of times, when you have a technology, there's going to be a learning curve. So, what is that learning curve going to be like? How 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 much training is, is going to be involved? Um, how difficult or how easy is it going to be for um, the people that are going to be using it. Um, so we just want to make sure that we understand, you know, the, all of the, the implications of adopting that technology. And April, where does the heartburn come from for you when you want to go with someone or something new? The heartburn comes from the fact that we produce 
many, many shows a year with many, many different audience types. The shows themselves actually feel different, even though we're all focused in the construction industry. And so trying to explain that you need to kind of treat us like we're 12 small businesses that happen to co-locate as opposed to one major trade show company is usually a heartburn pain point for me. My technology vendors have to be responsive and they have to be flexible and they have to have the ability to not just expect us to use out of the box across the board for all of our shows that we will be able to customize and tailor based on our audience needs and our business strategy. I also think that there's a risk with whether or not you choose a tenured technology partner, somebody who's been in the space for quite some time, versus a startup. I think a startup can be pretty rewarding, especially if it's a pilot, but I also always look out for, yeah, we can do that. If that's not what you do, I don't want you to try to make your technology platform do something that you didn't design it to do. So I always, I'm always listening for the word can versus do, because I want to know that they're already doing it, not that they can. So I always get a little bit nervous when they try to create something new that is not part of what the scope of their product is. Mm -hmm. So you're saying that just the fact that it's a startup does not automatically disqualify them, but, um, you know, with the exception of not using the words like it might or we can do that, what would absolutely sort of convince you? What do you need to see or what do they need to provide you with? Um, in terms of a startup to demonstrate that they could do it? Uh, test Drive. Test Drive speaks volumes to me. If I can use their platform for free for seven days, 14 days, 30 days, whatever the standard trial period is, so I can actually, you know, pick it and see if it does what I want to. If I actually push significant data into it, does it hemorrhage and fall down? Those sorts of things are very important to me. Uh, if I don't have that, I, then I actually want to come on site. I want to see their office. I want to meet their staff. I want to talk to their technology officer who built the thing. And I want to sit there and speak nerd with that person so that I can kind of get at the heart of what we're trying to do here. Mm -hmm. I like that, speak nerd. So I want to now kind of switch the focus of the, the last two questions and be sort of the vendor advocate. Because I've, I've been on the supplier side over the years. And, and I know firsthand that it's very difficult sometimes to first get in the door, second, find out who's the decision maker, third, find out what, what it is you already have, what it is you might need. So I'm going to start with Andrea. I mean, what do you love or hate about technology vendors just to begin with? And, and bearing in mind that sort of what I'm trying to understand is, you know, they're at a disadvantage, I think, from the get-go and they're trying to use all their different traditional and some new channels to get to you just to give you their message, you know, give you their spiel, whatever. And I want to know, you know, what is it that some of them are doing right, some of them are doing poorly, what do you love or hate? I mean, obviously you don't want to get calls at home, but um, are there folks that are giving you calls, you know, that are calling you up saying, I've got this really great thing, but, they, but you can tell they don't know what they're talking about or they don't understand your needs? What's going on out there that, that vendors need to be aware of? Well, I've kind of seen everything that you've mentioned, and some of it's not very pretty. Um, I, my favorite is when they do call me and share all this great, wonderful technology, and they can't get past the front door. And I can catch them on the third question, and they're like, um, uh, I'll get back to you. That is my favorite. Nonetheless, one of the things I really hate is don't sell me. I don't want to hear your spiel. Talk facts. What does it do? What are your limitations? How is it going to help me? What makes you different than everybody else? Those are the, the questions right on the front end. I don't, I don't, don't name drop. I mean, seriously. And then secondly, I want to test drive it. Can I play with it? Who's using it? How are they using it? May I talk to them? I want to go on show site and play with it, um, see how it actually works. And what I look for in a technology vendor is I want somebody who listens to me. And I think that kind of goes back to don't sell me. Ask me questions. Hear what my needs are and how, does your product fit my needs? And be frank with me. If I'm looking for X and you're selling X plus Y, be frank with me. That's not what we're doing. That's not our space. So don't waste most of our time. Um, and I'm looking for partnerships. Somebody, again, I think I said this earlier, somebody, again, who will work with me 
So I know how to work their system, how to work with their tech people, and how to improve my product and my delivery of data. And customer service. When we're on show site, it's hectic. And I want somebody who, again, with that partnership, I know I can do this on the back end. I know I can do this myself, but can you help me? And having that customer service is huge. So those are the three things that I really, really value in a vendor. That listening and that partnership are incredible. So, Scott, I'm intrigued by the fact that you're a content marketer yourself. So is that something that kind of moves your uh, decisions about vendors, um, things that you love or hate about a specific vendor? Is the fact that they're marketing to you with content or in other ways other than just calling you up or sending you an email and saying, hey, this is what I've got? Or are there yeah. other things that move you? Yeah, absolutely. Um you know, one of one of the things as a content marketer is I I tend to um, um, t tend to subscribe to a lot of other other vendors' uh, content marketing efforts. Um, you know, one of the old sayings I used to be in sales is, is that it's very easy to sell a salesperson because they tend to even though they understand the tactics that are happening, they tend to empathize with it. And um, it's, it's same with content marketing. I love to um, subscribe to other other people's content marketing efforts if they do a good job at it. So if I keep if I if I get a newsletter that's constantly talking about their services, um, I unsubscribe to it. But if I um, if I you know I'm getting newsletters and content from you constantly that are thought leadership focused, solution focused, that are, are helping me with a lot of my um, problems that I'm try trying to solve for. When it comes time to look for a vendor with those services, um, you know, that, that's the direction I'm going to look at first. So, so that kind of helps, um, you know, um, help, helps me to, to filter out, you know, a, lo a lot of the, the groups I'm going to work with. But, you know, as far as people calling in, you know, again, our procurement process really helps our, with that area. So, so I, it, it gets a lot of those uh, outside calls get filtered out. So, you know, we, we don't, we're, you know, that's one of the plus sides of having a very good pro procurement process. So, April, have you come across any vendors that have done something really egregious and, and offensive and or something you really, really love? You just said you went for a new um, marketing platform, um, did they do something that really turned you on? Uh, I don't think anything truly horrible has ever happened to me with any technology vendor in my entire career. So knock on wood, let's hope that, that that continues to be the trend. What I love the most, talking to potential partners or people who you know cold call me or even some of the existing long-term relationships that we've had with some of our technology vendors, I love the new ideas that they bring to the table because sometimes in an organization you do what you have to do to solve whatever the crisis of the moment is, and then that somehow becomes the de facto process and procedure for how you do it in the future. And then you talk to your vendors, and they're like, well, you know, there are other organizations that do it this way, and it's just like, wow, you know, you, you've got a brilliant insight into that this doesn't even have to be something that's painful, that I just assume that that's part of the task is that I experience some pain as part of that process. But if there's a better solution or a better idea or something I can learn from one of their other clients, I get so excited by that. Or sometimes it'll just be general chatter like, oh, hey, I totally did this and it's really cool, like if it's a new tool or something that we're piloting. Uh, and I love it, and they go, oh, yeah, As, you know, if you love that, you might also love that. So get the inspiration and the ideas. I just, I think it's spectacular. Like a human suggestion engine. If you Absolutely. like this, then you'll like that. So, April, I want to just I'll pose this last question for you. So how can vendors, what's the best way for them to know what you're looking for or even just at least be in the ballpark about what, what you might consider? How do they get through the firewall of, for-profit organizations, how can they sell to you in the best way that allows them to appear professional and respectful? I am very active online. So via Twitter, via LinkedIn group, if they're not overtly just trying to sell their product, if they're 
asking a question or they're posting a, a PR release or a new case study about something that they're working on, that will usually catch my eye. Um, they have to know who I am and what I do. It drives me crazy to get phone calls for analytic solutions, for example, where they're trying to sell me what I already do on a daily basis anyway. But how are uh, they going to know that? The, there's my LinkedIn profile. There's my bio on Twitter. There are the kinds of conversations and blog posts that I'm creating. If, if somebody really wants to sell to me, I would appreciate that they take 10 minutes to Google me to get to know me and understand what I'm all about. And it's, I'm not saying that any technology purchase for our organization needs to be all about me, but it's a huge waste of time when people call to try to sell me something that if you had just bothered to Google me or my company or any of our trade shows, you would know we already do it, and you're wasting my time. That drives me bonkers. Mm -hmm. So, Scott, I know you have this procurement department that's going to sort of narrow down um, some of the options that are viable in your, in your channel, your purchase channel. But um, is there a best way, uh, you know, a good way for vendors to be respectful about pitching new technology to you and, and understanding what your needs are? You know, I think I think um, it's it's probably more difficult if you if you're just doing it cold um, coming into the into you know I'm trying to pitch it within us. But if you're if you're doing it at you know an event or like a trade show and things like that, that then then it's just a matter of understanding what you know who we are and and l l I think has been said before is understanding how your solution can fit our company and what we're doing. Um, and if you if you can talk the language that that we speak and, and make it make it real for us, th then then it's something that I would consider, um, you know, and, and then then I can help you get in through the front door. But tr you know, if you if you're trying to get get in through the front door cold, it's going to be very difficult. And Andrea, how can they get to you, get to your organization, do it in the way that you find palatable and agreeable? I agree with what they said before. You've got to know. You've got to know my shows. Know me, not me specifically, but offshore technology conference. You you've got to know my audience, and and don't sell me something that is uh, my audience is mostly engineers. They don't want something fluffy. So um, know what my audience is. Know me, and sell me something that fits into what we're doing. And it's kind of hard to get into our front door. And if popping an email, I do email. I'm like April. I'm online a lot. Um, I do watch some of the groups, and I, I frankly talk to other associations out there and find out what they're doing. So references and are huge for me. And I get most of my ideas that way. But getting in this front door cold is I'll if you have something I'm interested in, I'll, I'll give you the time of day and I'll listen to what you have to say. And um, but it's it's hard, frankly, it, but know my audience. So I've got a couple of questions from the audience. And um, John Martinez wants to know from Scott, how much does Windows 8 influence your decision-making? Is that something, um, you know, in terms of PC-based platforms or Windows 8-based platforms of any technology that you have to consider? Um, it but when I'm doing it for the event itself, um, not necessarily, but it influences my storytelling. So I don't necessarily need to look at, you know, we try to integrate our technology as much as possible into the show floor, but what we'll do is we'll look at how can we tell the story the best that we can. So, um, you know, it's just a matter of, you know, using using technology to to communicate as as effectively as possible. So John also wants to know from April. April, does your group think out of the box and look for new ideas versus just using technology? I think you made the point earlier about you know not using technology for technology's sake, but he's referring to both post and pre exhibition periods. I guess let's talk about marketing. Are you looking for new stuff, or you just want to go after the shiny object? I'm very much not a shiny object girl. Despite the fact that I am a technology enthusiast, I have to 
always remind myself and remind my staff that we are not our audiences. We, as marketers and innovators here at Hanley Woods, we're, we're not representative of our average attendee base. We're a little bit more tech savvy and a little bit more sensitive to certain things because that's the world that we live in. Um, when I said out of the box before, what I was specifically referring to is the default functionality that would come with a software program. Usually that's not good enough, and we usually require customization most of the time for at least one or more of our shows because the audiences, the processes, the experiences are different. But we are always looking for new ideas. So if you have some for me, John, I would be happy to take them. Mm -hmm. And again, back to Scott, um, this is a question about obviously you've tried hybrid and virtual you know, platforms for your event, Scott. Um, what, what are your overall thoughts? on whether those have worked or not in the context of what you're trying to do at Microsoft with your event? Um, they, they've worked very well. Um, a lot of it depends on your audience. So you, you have to understand whether your audience it would um, be interested in something like that, but my technical audiences are. Um, and it's just another great way for us to ex extend the experience. I mean, you have a lot of great content at the face-to-face -face experiences, and, and virtual and hybrid is not going to replace it. Um, be the, the engagement ability and all the great stuff that happens at in-person events. But the hybrid and virtual events are able to scale that message out to a much wider audience, make it global, make it last longer. So it's something that is definitely a good fit for you know, extending that message at a very, very reasonable cost. Thank you. And we've reached sort of the top of the hour here. I want to, again, thank OnStream for providing this platform, for sponsoring this webinar. And they've been such a great partner for all the webinars that I've done for TSNN. I want to also thank all three of my panelists. It's been an absolutely enlightening and fantastic discussion. Andrea, Scott, and April, I, I, I owe you big for this. I know you're both very, very busy people coming in from all cities uh, around the country and the world. Andrea, thank you so much. And I really appreciate your participation. And um, if, if anyone has other questions, you can certainly send them on to TSNN, and I'll try and get them answered for you. But Thank you again so much for allowing us to peek into your brain and for our audience um, fielding us, you know, sending us questions so we can really understand what your needs are. Thanks again, and hope you all have a great day. Thank you. This does conclude today's webinar. We thank you for your participation. You may disconnect your lines at this time, and have a great day.